Well, good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. And I would like to start off first by thanking the program for air quality for the, the funding that actually got this study that I'll be presenting to you started. We've spent the last winter uh, monitoring the inversion and frantically bringing people into our laboratory to do studies on them. And the question that we've been asking is, what is the effect of ambient air pollution, particularly Salt Lake's homemade pollution, on vascular function in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, or COPD? Now, if you're anything like my friend that I was talking to this weekend, you might be thinking, did he just say vascular function? He means pulmonary function, right? But I actually do mean vascular function. And I hope by the end of the talk that you'll, you'll see why it is important to look at vascular function in pollution. Now, the relationship between particulate matter pollution and lung function is pretty intuitive. You inhale the particles, they irritate your lung. It makes sense that your lungs will be affected. But the link between pollution and cardiovascular function, it's not as intuitive. But there's a lot of evidence piling up indicating that the more you're exposed to particulate matter pollution, the higher cardiovascular risk. We see increased rates of heart attack during times of high pollution. Uh, increased exposure to pollution increases atherosclerosis or plaque in the arteries. So there's definitely a link there. But what it is, it's not exactly clear. There's several different theories and hypotheses. And we're working off of one. And the theory goes that during time, when you inhale these particulates, it irritates your lung. And that irritation in initiates an inflammation response. And part of this inflammatory response is to increase the release of something we call free radicals. These are highly reactive molecules that will bind with anything and they're normal in your body. You usually have them, they serve a very important purpose. But when we have too many of them, it can cause damage and stress in the body. And during times when you have high levels of free radicals, we call that oxidative stress. And the theory is that with the pollution, you get oxidative stress, and those free radicals end up binding to something very important in the vascular system called nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is a chemical that's very related to the healthier cardiovascular system. The more of it you have, generally the better. We see that it's related to vasodilation. When your arteries need to get bigger, they release nitric oxide and they expand to meet the demand for blood flow. Nitric oxide also has, is, has properties that make it anti-atherogenic and anti-thrombotic. So in short, when you're exposed to, the theory is when you're exposed to the particulate matter pollution, you get this inflammatory response that decreases nitric oxide availability in the arteries, decreases vascular function, and increases your cardiovascular risk. Now patients with COPD, we think that they're at greater risk because they have alterations in their lungs. This is a shot of the lung of a healthy person. These are the alveoli from a healthy lung. And these are the alveoli from a person with COPD. When a person with COPD inhales particulates, more of those particulates stay in their lung than would stay in a lung of a healthy lung, of a healthy person. In addition to that, we've recently seen that patients with COPD actually have a weakened defense system against oxidative stress. So with that in mind, we ask the questions, are these patients at more risk for cardiovascular dysfunction when exposed to particulates than their healthy controls? And we also wanted to know, is oxidative stress what's meeting, mediating this? So as far as methods, we closely monitored the pollution this year. And here's a graph of the particulate matter pollution in Salt Lake for this year, uh, each day along the x-axis and PM 2.5 along the y. For our study, we brought people in during two bad air days, usually at the onset or at the onset of the inversion, about 48 hours into the inversion, and then again five or six days into the inversion. We then brought them in again on a clean air day after four to seven days of clean air so we could get the comparison between bad air and clean air. 
when we brought them in, we had them to go through a whole series of studies. It usually took about three hours. And we started with the pulmonary function test where we had them breathe into a, respiro or a spirometer. And we took forced vital capacity. We also did blood draws. And with this blood, we'll later analyze it to see if inflammation has gone up with pollution and if oxidative stress has gone up. What the bulk of our time went towards with our subjects was vascular function assessments. And we did a whole, whole battery of assessments, but the two that I'll focus on today, we call flow-mediated dilation and passive limb movement. Both of these assessments utilize an ultrasound machine to visualize arteries and measure blood flow. And they're highly indicative of the vascular health of the body and of nitric oxide availability within the artery. In flow-mediated dilation, uh, we put a cuff on the arm, uh, a blood pressure cuff, and we inflate that cuff uh, to where blood flow is occluded so the hand isn't getting blood flow. And we hold it there for five minutes, and just about the time when your hand's about to fall asleep, we release that cuff, and the blood rushes down into your hand. And that rushing of blood causes the artery to vasodilate or get bigger. And the bigger it gets, the healthier, and presumably more nitric oxide that's there. With passive limb movement, we have a subject sit in a chair or lie on a bed. In this case, we had them sit in a chair, and we move their leg for them back and forth. So we're passively moving their leg. And it looks silly, but when we move the leg, we get a reliable increase in blood flow to the leg. And we've documented in our lab that it's up to 80% dependent on nitric oxide. So the theory is that with exposure to the pollution, we'll see a decrease dilation with FMD and decreasing blood flow with passive limb movement. So let's move on to the results. First off, we'll look at pulmonary function. This is interesting. Whoa, that just ended everything. Okay, so here is forced expiratory volume in one second. This is the FEV1. This is how much air the subjects can exhale in one second. And it's represented as percent of predicted. We see our controls are coming in right at 100% of predicted on a clean air day. And our patients, around 50%. And that's what you would expect. They have COPD. They have a lung disease. What's interesting is when we expose both groups to pollution, whether on day three of the inversion or day five of the inversion, we don't see any effect on the, the lung function thus far. And that's surprising because you would think if you're going to see an effect of the particulates on anything, it would be in the lung because that's what's in direct contact with the particulates. But what we do see an effect on is actually the vascular function. Here's flow-mediated dilation. And first off, you'll notice that the patients have a, about half the dilation compared to the controls. This is something we've seen in the past. And with this... Uh, with the pollution, we see that the controls have a dramatic decrease in FMD. And it doesn't get better during the course of the pollution. We thought maybe on our second pollution day measurement, it would be restored, but it doesn't happen. We see a similar trend with the patients, but this time it's not as dramatic, probably because they're starting off low to begin with. We see a similar story when we look at passive limb movement. Here on the y-axis, this is leg blood flow, and this is time on the x-axis. You can see when we start moving the leg right here uh, in the controls on the clean air day, we get a pretty good increase in blood flow. But when they come in and we do it on the polluted air days, we don't get that increase in blood flow, indicating that they have decreased nit nitric oxide and probably greater cardiovascular risk. When we look at the patients, we see a similar trend, but again, it's just not as dramatic or impressive because they're starting off so low to begin with. Here we see that it goes down, but it's not as impressive. If we look at it as area under the curve or how much area is underneath each of these different lines, you can see that from clean air to bad air, it's going down in both groups. So to summarize the results, and thus far we've seen that exposure to Salt Lake's homegrown inversion doesn't have that great of an effect or a major effect on our lung function thus far. Other people have seen that, but we're probably just underpowered to see it. But what we do see is an effect on the cardiovascular function. 
And it's contrary to our hypothesis, it's more dramatic in the controls, in the healthy people, than in the patients, probably because of a basement effect where they start off so low. So where do we go from here? First off, we definitely need to get more people enrolled in the study. So we're kind of hoping for an inversion next year, one or two. But if we don't get it, no problem. And we're kind of happy that way too. But if we do find in the end that, that everything's mediated, or part of it's mediated by oxidative stress, we'd like to look at the possibility of maybe a preventative treatment. We recently documented that uh, administering an antioxidant cocktail to patients with COPD, this is like vitamin C, vitamin E, to these patients increases flow-mediated dilation. Now, with the pollution, our healthy controls, we're looking a whole lot like these patients with COPD, the vascular function was way down. So the thought is, perhaps we can administer this vitamin cocktail and mitigate the effects of the pollution. That's where we'd like to go. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank everyone who's contributed to the study and helped it get off the ground, and I'd be happy to entertain any questions that we have time for.